Section 5 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 1, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sherry Elston. Section 5 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 1 the corpus delecti part one by melville davison post eighteen sixty nine through nineteen thirty melville davison post introduction to the corpus delecti the high ground of the field of crime has not been explored it has not even been entered the bookstalls have been filled to weariness with tales based upon plans whereby the detective or ferreting power of the state might be baffled but prodigious marvel no writer has attempted to construct tales based upon plans whereby the punishing power of the state might be baffled the distinction if one pauses for a moment to consider it is striking it is possible even easy deliberately to plan crimes so that the criminal agent and the criminal agency cannot be detected is it possible to plan and execute wrongs in such a manner that they will have all the effect and all the resulting profit of desperate crimes and yet not be crimes before the law we are prone to forget that the law is no perfect structure that it is simply the result of human labor and human genius and that whatever laws human ingenuity can create for the protection of men those same laws human ingenuity can evade the spirit of evil is no dwarf he has developed equally with the spirit of good all wrongs are not crimes indeed only those wrongs are crimes in which certain technical elements are present the law provides a procrustean standard for all crimes thus a wrong to become criminal must fit exactly into the measure laid down by the law else it is no crime if it varies never so little from the legal measure the law must and will refuse to regard it as criminal no matter how injurious a wrong it may be there is no measure of morality or equity or common right that can be applied to the individual case the gauge of the law is iron bound the wrong measured by this gauge is either a crime or it is not there is no middle ground hence is it that if one knows well the technicalities of the law one may commit horrible wrongs that will yield all the gain and all the resulting effect of the highest crimes and yet the wrongs perpetrated will constitute no one of the crimes described by the law thus the highest crimes even murder may be committed in such a manner that although the criminal is known and the law holds him in custody yet it cannot punish him so it happens that in this year of our lord of the nineteenth century the skilful attorney marvels at the stupidity of the rogue who committing crimes by the ordinary methods subjects himself to unnecessary peril when the result which he seeks can easily be attained by other methods equally expeditious and without danger of liability in any criminal tribunal this is the field into which the author has ventured and he believes it to be new and full of interest it may be objected that the writer has prepared here a textbook for the shrewd knave to this it is answered that if he instructs the enemies he also warns the friends of law and order and that evil has never yet been stronger because the sun shone on it the corpus delecti part one that man mason said samuel wilcock is the mysterious member of this club he is more than that he is the mysterious man of new york i was much surprised to see him answered his companion marshall st clair of the great law firm of seward st clair and demuth i had lost track of him since he went to paris as counsel for the american stockholders of the canal company when did he come back to the states he turned up suddenly in his ancient haunts about four months ago said walcott as grand gloomy and peculiar as napoleon ever was in his palmiest days the younger members of the club call him zanona redivivus he wanders through the house usually at night apparently without noticing anything or anybody 
His mind seems to be deeply and busily at work, leaving his bodily self to wander as it may happen. Naturally, strange stories are told of him. Indeed, his individuality and his habit of doing some unexpected thing, and doing it in such a marvelously original manner that men who are experts at it look on in wonder, cannot fail to make him an object of interest. He has never been known to play at any game, whatever, and yet one night he sat down to the chess table with old Admiral Dubray. You know the Admiral is the great champion since he beat the French and English officers in the tournament last winter. Well, you also know that the conventional openings at chess are scientifically and accurately determined. To the utter disgust of Dubray, Mason opened the game with an unheard-of attack from the extremes of the board. The old admiral stopped and, in a kindly, patronizing way, pointed out the weak and absurd folly of his move and asked him to begin again with some one of the safe openings. Mason smiled and answered that if one had a head that he could trust, he should use it if not then it was the part of wisdom to follow blindly the dead forms of some man who had a head dubray was naturally angry and set himself to demolish mason as quickly as possible the game was rapid for a few moments mason lost piece after piece his opening was broken and destroyed and its utter folly apparent to the lookers-on the admiral smiled, and the game seemed all one-sided when, suddenly, to his utter horror, Dubray found that his king was in a trap. The foolish opening had been only a piece of shrewd strategy. The old admiral fought and cursed and sacrificed his pieces, but it was of no use. He was gone. Mason checkmated him in two moves, and arose wearily where in heaven's name man said the old admiral thunderstruck did you learn that masterpiece just here replied mason to play chess one should know his opponent how could the dead masters lay down rules by which you could be beaten sir they had never seen you and thereupon he turned and left the room of course st clair such a strange man would soon become an object of all kinds of mysterious rumours some are true and some are not at any rate i know that mason is an unusual man with a gigantic intellect of late he seems to have taken a strange fancy to me in fact i seem to be the only member of the club that he will talk with and i confess that he startles and fascinates me he is an original genius st clair of an unusual order i recall vividly said the younger man that before mason went to paris he was considered one of the greatest lawyers of the city and he was feared and hated by the bar at large he came here i believe from virginia and began with a high-grade criminal practice he soon became famous for his powerful and ingenious defences he found holes in the law through which his clients escaped holes that by the profession at large were not suspected to exist and that frequently astonished the judges his ability caught the attention of the great corporations they tested him and found in him learning and unlimited resources he pointed out methods by which they could evade obnoxious statutes by which they could comply with the apparent letter of the law and yet violate its spirit and advised them well in that most important of all things just how far they could bend the law without breaking it at the time he left for paris he had a vast clientage and was in the midst of a brilliant career the day he took passage from new york the bar lost sight of him no matter how great a man may be the wave soon closes over him in a city like this in a few years mason was forgotten now only the older practitioners would recall him and they would do so with hatred and bitterness he was a tireless savage uncompromising fighter always a recluse well said walcott he reminds me of a great world-weary cynic transplanted from some ancient mysterious empire when i come into the man's presence i feel instinctively in the grip of his intellect i tell you st clair randolph mason is the mysterious man of new york at this moment a messenger boy came into the room and handed mr walcott a telegram st clair said that gentleman rising the directors of the elevated are in session and we must hurry the two men put on their coats and left the house samuel walcott was not a club man after the manner of the smart set and yet he was in fact a club man he was a bachelor in the latter thirties and resided in a great silent house on the avenue on the street he was a man of substance 
shrewd and progressive, backed by great wealth. He had various corporate interests in the larger syndicates, but the basis and foundation of his fortune was real estate. His houses on the avenue were the best possible property, and his elevator row in the importer's quarter was indeed a literal gold mine. It was known that many years before his grandfather had died and left him the property, which at that time was of no great value. Young Walcott had gone out into the gold fields and had been lost sight of and forgotten. Ten years afterwards he had turned up suddenly in New York and taken possession of his property, then vastly increased in value. His speculations were almost phenomenally successful, and, backed by the now enormous value of his real property, he was soon on a level with the merchant princes. His judgment was considered sound, and he had the full confidence of his business associates for safety and caution. Fortune heaped up riches around him with a lavish hand. He was unmarried, and the halo of his wealth caught the keen eye of the matron with marriageable daughters. He was invited out, caught by the whirl of society, and tossed into its maelstrom. In a measure he reciprocated. He kept horses and a yacht. His dinners at Delmonico's and the club were above reproach. But withal he was a silent man, with a shadow deep in his eyes and seemed to court the society of his fellows, not because he loved them, but because he either hated or feared solitude. For years the strategy of the matchmaker had gone gracefully afield, but fate is relentless. If she shields the victim from the traps of men, it is not because she wishes him to escape, but because she is pleased to reserve him for her own trap. So it happened that when Virginia St. Clair assisted Mrs. Miriam Stuyvesant at her midwinter reception, this same Samuel Walcott fell deeply and hopelessly and utterly in love, and it was so apparent to the beaten generals present that Mrs. Miriam Stuyvesant applauded herself, so to speak, with encore after encore. It was good to see this courteous, silent man literally at the feet of the young debutante. He was there of right even the mothers of marriageable daughters admitted that the young girl was brown-haired brown-eyed and tall enough said the experts and of the blue blood royal with all the grace courtesy and inbred genius of such princely heritage perhaps it was objected by the censors of the smart set that miss st clair's frankness and honesty were a trifle old-fashioned and that she was a shadowy bit of a puritan and perhaps it was of these same qualities that Samuel Walcott received his hurt. At any rate, the hurt was there and deep, and the new actor stepped up into the old-time-worn semi-tragic drama and began his role with a tireless, utter sincerity that was deadly dangerous if he lost. Perhaps a week after the conversation between St. Clair and Walcott, Randolph Mason stood in the private waiting-room of the club, with his hands behind his back. He was a man apparently in the middle forties, tall and reasonably broad across the shoulders, muscular without being either stout or lean. His hair was thin and of a brown color with erratic streaks of gray. His forehead was broad and high and of a faint reddish color. His eyes were restless inky black and not over large. The nose was big and muscular and bowed. The eyebrows were black and heavy, almost bushy. There were heavy furrows running from the nose downward and outward to the corners of the mouth. The mouth was straight, and the jaw was heavy and square. Looking at the face of Randolph Mason from above, the expression in repose was crafty and cynical. Viewed from below upward, it was savage and vindictive, almost brutal, while from the front, if looked squarely in the face, the stranger was fascinated by the animation of the man, and at once concluded that his expression was fearless and sneering. He was evidently of southern extraction, and a man of unusual power. A fire smouldered on the hearth. It was a crisp evening in the early fall, and with that far-off touch of melancholy which ever heralds the coming winter, even in the midst of a city. The man's face looked tired and ugly. His long white hands were clasped tight together. His entire figure and face wore every mark of weakness and physical exhaustion, but his eyes contradicted. They were red and restless. In the private dining-room, the dinner-party was in the best of spirits. Samuel Walcott was happy. Across the table from him was Miss Virginia St. Clair, radiant, a tinge of color in her cheeks. On either side, Miss Miriam Stuyvesant and Marshal St. Clair 
were brilliant and light-hearted. Walcott looked at the young girl, and the measure of his worship was full. He wondered for the thousandth time how she could possibly love him, and by what earthly miracle she had come to accept him, and how it would be to always have her across the table from him, his own table, in his own house. They were about to rise from the table when one of the waiters entered the room and handed Walcott an envelope. He thrust it quickly into his pocket. In the confusion of rising, the others did not notice him, but his face was ash-white, and his hands trembled violently as he placed the wraps around the bewitching shoulders of Miss St. Clair. Marshal, he said, and despite the powerful effort his voice was hollow, you will see the lady safely cared for. I am called to attend a grave matter. All right, Walcott, answered the young man with cheery good nature. You are too serious, old man. Trot along. The poor dear, murmured Miss Duvisant, after Walcott had helped them to the carriage and turned to go up the steps of the club. The poor dear is hard hit, and men are such funny creatures when they are hard hit. Samuel Walcott, as his fate would, went direct to the private writing-room and opened the door. The lights were not turned on, and in the dark he did not see Mason motionless by the mantel-shelf. He went quickly across the room to the writing-table turned on one of the lights and taking the envelope from his pocket tore it open then he bent down by the light to read the contents as his eyes ran over the paper his jaw fell the skin drew away from his cheek bones and his face seemed literally to sink in his knees gave way under him and he would have gone down in a heap had it not been for mason's long arms that closed around him and held him up the human economy is ever mysterious the moment the new danger threatened the latent power of the man as an animal hidden away in the centres of intelligence asserted itself his hand clutched the paper and with a half slide he turned in mason's arms for a moment he stared up at the ugly man whose thin arms felt like wire ropes you are under the deadfall eh said mason the cunning of my enemy is sublime your enemy gasped walcott when did you come into it how in god's name did you know it how your enemy mason looked down at the wide bulging eyes of the man who should know better than i he said haven't i broken through all the traps and plots that she could set she she trap you the man's voice was full of horror the old schemer muttered mason the cowardly old schemer to strike in the back but we can beat her she did not count on my helping you i who know her so well mason's face was red and his eyes burned in the midst of it all he had dropped his hands and went over to the fire samuel walcott arose panting and stood looking at mason with his hands behind him on the table the naturally strong nature and the rigid school in which the man had been trained presently began to tell his composure in part returned and he thought rapidly what did this strange man know was he simply making shrewd guesses or had he some mysterious knowledge of this matter walcott could not know that mason meant only fate that he believed her to be his great enemy walcott had never before doubted his own ability to meet any emergency this mighty jerk had carried him off his feet he was unstrung and panic-stricken at any rate this man had promised help he would take it he put the paper and envelope carefully into his pocket smoothed out his rumpled coat and going over to mason touched him on the shoulder come he said if you are going to help me we must go the man turned and followed him without a word in the hall mason put on his hat and overcoat and the two went out into the street walcott hailed a cab and the two were driven to his house on the avenue walcott took out his latch-key opened the door and led the way into the library he turned on the light and motioned Mason to seat himself at the table. Then he went into another room, and presently returned with a bundle of papers and a decanter of brandy. He poured out a glass of the liquor and offered it to Mason. The man shook his head. Walcott poured the contents of the glass down his own throat. Then he set the decanter down and drew up a chair on the side of the table opposite Mason. Sir, said Walcott in a voice deliberate indeed, but as hollow as a sepulchre, i am done for god has finally gathered up the ends of the net and it is knotted tight am i not here to help you said mason turning savagely i can beat fate give me the details of her trap he bent forward and rested his arms on the table his streaked gray hair was rumpled on end and his face was ugly for a moment walcott did not answer 
he moved a little into the shadow then he spread the bundle of old yellow papers out before him to begin with he said i am living a lie a gilded cry made sham every bit of me there is not an honest piece anywhere it is all lie i am a liar and a thief before men the property which i possess is not mine but stolen from a dead man the very name which i bear is not my own but is the bastard child of a crime i am more than all that i am a murderer a murderer before the law a murderer before god and worse than a murderer before the pure woman whom i love more than anything that god could make he paused for a moment and wiped the perspiration from his face sir said mason this is all drivel infantile drivel what you are is of no importance how to get out is the problem how to get out samuel walcott leaned forward and poured out a glass of brandy and swallowed it well he said speaking slowly my right name is richard warren in the spring of eighteen seventy nine i came to new york and fell in with the real samuel walcott a young man with a little money and some property which his grandfather had left him we became friends and concluded to go to the far west together accordingly we scraped together what money we could lay our hands on and landed in the gold-mining regions of california we were young and inexperienced and our money went rapidly one april morning we drifted into a little shack camp away up in the sierra nevadas called hell's elbow here we struggled and starved for perhaps a year finally in utter desperation walcott married the daughter of a mexican gambler who ran an eating-house and a poker joint with them we lived from hand to mouth in a wild god-forsaken way for several years after a time the woman began to take a strange fancy to me walcott finally noticed it and grew jealous one night in a drunken brawl we quarrelled and i killed him it was late at night and beside the woman there were four of us in the poker room the mexican gambler a half-breed devil called cherubin pete walcott and myself when walcott fell the half-breed whipped out his weapon and fired at me across the table but the woman nina san croix struck him his arm and instead of killing me as he intended the bullet mortally wounded her father the mexican gambler i shot the half-breed through the forehead and turned round expecting the woman to attack me on the contrary she pointed to the window and bade me wait for her on the cross trail below it was fully three hours later before the woman joined me at the place indicated she had a bag of gold dust a few jewels that belonged to her father and a package of papers i asked her why she had stayed behind so long and she replied that the men were not killed outright and that she had brought a priest to them and waited until they had died this was the truth but not all the truth moved by superstition or foresight the woman had induced the priest to take down the sworn statements of the two dying men seal it and give it to her this paper she brought with her all this i learned afterwards at the time i knew nothing of this damning evidence we struck out for the pacific coast the country was lawless the privations we endured were almost past belief at times the woman exhibited cunning and ability that were almost genius and through it all often in the very fingers of death her devotion to me never wavered it was dog-like and seemed to be her only object on earth when we reached san francisco the woman put these papers into my hands walcott took up the yellow package and pushed it across the table to mason she proposed that i assume walcott's name and that we come boldly to new york and claim the property i examined the papers found a copy of the will by which walcott inherited the property a bundle of correspondence and sufficient documentary evidence to establish his identity beyond the shadow of a doubt desperate gambler as i now was i quailed before the daring plan of nina san croix i urged that i richard warren would be known that the attempted fraud would be detected and would result in investigation and perhaps unearth the whole terrible matter 
The woman pointed out how much I resemble Walcott. What vast changes ten years of such life as we had led would naturally be expected to make in men! How utterly impossible it would be to trace back the fraud to Walcott's murder at Hell's Elbow, in the wild passes of the Sierra Nevadas! She bade me remember that we were both outcasts, both crime-branded, both enemies of man's law and God's, and that we had nothing to lose. We were both sunk to the bottom. Then she laughed, and she said that she had not found me a coward until now, but if I had turned chicken-hearted, that was the end of it, of course. The result was we sold the gold dust and jewels in San Francisco, took on such evidences of civilization as possible, and purchased passage to New York on the best steamer we could find. I was growing to depend on the bold gambler spirit of this woman, Nina San Croix. I felt the need of her strong, profligate nature. She was of a queer breed and a queerer school. Her mother was the daughter of a Spanish engineer, and had been stolen by the Mexican, her father. She herself had been raised and educated as best might be in one of the monasteries along the Rio Grande, and had there grown to womanhood before her father, fleeing into the mountains of California, carried her with him. When we landed in New York I offered to announce her as my wife, but she refused, saying that her presence would excite comment and perhaps attract the attention of Walcott's relatives. We therefore arranged that I should go alone into the city, claim the property, and announce myself as Samuel Walcott, and that she should remain under cover until such time as we would feel the ground safe under us. Every detail of the plan was fatally successful. I established my identity without difficulty and secured the property. It had increased vastly in value, and I, as Samuel Walcott, soon found myself a rich man. I went to Nina San Croix in hiding and gave her a large sum of money, which she purchased a residence in a retired part of the city, far up in the northern suburb. Here she lived secluded and unknown while I remained in the city, living here as a wealthy bachelor. I did not attempt to abandon the woman, but went to her from time to time in disguise and under cover of the greatest secrecy. For a time everything ran smooth, the woman was still devoted to me above everything else, and thought always of my welfare first, and seemed content to wait so long as I thought best. My business expanded, I was sought after and consulted and drawn into the higher life of New York, and more and more felt that the woman was an albatross on my neck. I put her off with one excuse after another. Finally she began to suspect me, and demanded that I should recognize her as my wife. I attempted to point out the difficulties. She met them all by saying that we should both go to Spain. There I could marry her, and we could return to America, and drop into my place in society without causing more than a passing comment. I concluded to meet the matter squarely once and for all. I said that I would convert half of the property into money and give it to her, but that I would not marry her. She did not fly into a storming rage, as I had expected, but went quietly out of the room, and presently returned with two papers, which she read. One was the certificate of her marriage to Walcott, duly authenticated. The other was the dying statement of her father, the Mexican gambler, and of Samuel Walcott, charging me with murder. It was in proper form, and certified by the Jesuit priest. Now she said sweetly when she had finished which do you prefer to recognize your wife or to turn all the property over to samuel walcott's widow and hang for his murder i was dumbfounded and horrified i saw the trap that i was in and i consented to do anything she should say if she would only destroy the papers this she refused to do i pleaded with her and implored her to destroy them Finally, she gave them to me with a great show of returning confidence, and I tore them into bits and threw them into the fire. That was three months ago. We arranged to go to Spain and do as she said. She was to sail this morning, and I was to follow. Of course I never intended to go. I congratulated myself on the fact that all trace of evidence against me was destroyed, and that her grip was now broken. My plan was to induce her to sail, believing that I would follow. When she was gone I would marry Miss St. Clair, and if Nina St. Croix should return, I would defy her, 
and lock her up as a lunatic. But I was reckoning like an infernal ass to imagine for a moment that I could thus hoodwink such a woman as Nina St. Croix. Tonight I received this. Walcott took the envelope from his pocket and gave it to Mason. You saw the effect of it. Read it and you will understand why. I felt the death hand when I saw her writing on the envelope. Mason took the paper from the envelope. It was written in Spanish and ran. Greeting to Richard Warren. The great signor does his little Nina injustice to think she would go away to Spain and leave him to the beautiful American. She is not so thoughtless. Before she goes, she shall be oh so very rich, and the dear signor shall be oh so very safe. The archbishop and the kind church hate murderers. Nina San Croix. Of course, fool, the papers you destroyed were copies. N. San C. To this was penned a line in a delicate aristocratic hand, saying that the archbishop would willingly listen to Madame San Croix's statement if she would come to see him on Friday morning at eleven. You see, said Walcott desperately, there is no possible way out. I know the woman. When she decides to do a thing, that is the end of it. She has decided to do this. Mason turned around from the table, stretched out his long legs, and thrust his hands deep into his pockets. Walcott sat with his head down, watching Mason hopelessly, almost indifferently, his face blank and sunken. The ticking of the bronze clock on the mantel-shelf was loud, painfully loud. Suddenly Mason drew his knees in and bent over, put both his bony hands on the table and looked at Walcott. Sir, he said, this matter is in such shape that there is only one thing to do. This growth must be cut out at the roots and cut out quickly. This is the first fact to be determined, and a fool would know it. The second fact is that you must do it yourself. Hired killers are like the grave and the daughters of the horse-leech. They cry always, Give! Give! They are only palliatives, not cures. By using them, you swap perils. You simply take a stay of execution at best. The common criminal would know this. These are the facts of your problem. The master plotters of crime would see here but two difficulties to meet. A practical method for accomplishing the body of the crime, a cover for the criminal agent. They would see no farther and attempt to guard no farther. After they had provided a plan for the killing, and a means by which the killer could cover his trail and escape from the theater of the homicide, they would believe all the requirements of the problems met, and would stop. The greatest, the very giants among them, have stopped here and have been in great error. In every crime, especially in the great ones, there exists a third element, preeminently vital. This third element the master plotters have either overlooked or else have not had the genius to construct. They plan with rare cunning to baffle the victim. They plan with vast wisdom, almost genius, to baffle the trailer. But they fail utterly to provide any plan for baffling the punisher. Ergo, their plots are fatally defective and often result in ruin. Hence the vital necessity for providing the third element, the escape ipso jure. Mason arose, walked around the table, and put his hand firmly on Samuel Walcott's shoulder. This must be done to-morrow night, he continued. You must arrange your business matters to-morrow, and announce that you are going on a yacht cruise by order of your physician, and may not return for some weeks. You must prepare your yacht for a voyage, instruct your men to touch at a certain point on Staten Island, and wait until six o'clock day after to-morrow morning. If you do not come aboard by that time, they are to go to one of the South American ports and remain until further orders. By this means your absence for an indefinite period will be explained. You will go to Nina St. Croix, in the disguise which you have always used, and from her to the yacht, and by this means step out of your real status and back into it without leaving traces. I will come here to-morrow evening and furnish you with everything that you shall need, and give you full and exact instructions in every particular. 
these details you must execute with the greatest care as they will be vitally essential to the success of my plan through it all walcott had been silent and motionless now he arose and in his face there must have been some premonition of protest for mason stepped back and put out his hand sir he said with brutal emphasis not a word remember that you are only the hand and the hand does not think then he turned around abruptly and went out of the house end of section five recorded by sherry elston minnesota september 2009